Strategy refers to the implementation of coordinated actions with a specific purpose. For animals, the objective is basically twofold. Getting on in daily life and ensuring the survival of the species. And that changes everything for mammals, reptiles, herbivores or beasts of prey. For this lioness and her young, daily life will mean crossing the river, which she would naturally prefer to do without getting too wet. She half succeeds, or half fails, but in any case, this gives an idea of the approach to be used. Under their mother's watchful eye, all the cubs took the simplest way. They followed the path she showed them, even if none of them tried to jump from one rock to another. One cub is not playing the game. Too shy or too rebellious, he stayed on the other bank. He's hesitating and finally he decides not to cross, or at least not to cross at the same spot. We can see him taking an initiative here. He's running up and down the bank looking for a place to ford. There's a strategic effort behind this simple action. He's considering an alternative possibility in a given situation and choosing an effective option. When predators are looking for food, this effort to be effective can be crucial. These noos have almost nothing to fear from a cheetah, and the cheetah knows it. So if the cheetah is this attentive, it must have a chance, which means that it is not alone, it's working with its brother. By the end of the dash, the cheetah has managed to knock the prey off balance. But it's already exhausted, and the gnu grabs the chance to get back up. But the other cheetah has not been running, so it has the strength to hang on to the gnu's rump. This is a young gnu, but it still must weigh some hundred kilograms, twice as much as the hunter. Even when the two cheetahs are hunting together, the gnu still has more mass. The cheetah's canine teeth are very short and barely penetrate the victim's skin, but its jaw is shaped perfectly to hold on. It has to maintain its grip on the throat for several minutes. Now that the gnu has stopped struggling, one of the cheetahs lets up its pressure on the prey. Despite its stamina as a long-distance runner, the gnu is not going to make it in this situation. But as you can see from the way it bucks, the cheetah hunting by itself would have lost the match. While one of the cats begins eating the prey, the other checks that there's nothing threatening in the vicinity. This catch is a real godsend. There's plenty to fill up the two hunters, who usually make do on gazelles. A cheetah is estimated to need four kilograms of meat a day, but it can eat up to 14 kilograms. In that case, it doesn't have to hunt for four or five days. Unlike the other big cats, cheetahs do not hold their prey in their paws to eat it. They eat quickly for fear that something will come to steal the meal. Hunting as a pair has given them an unusual treat. 
One of them can take its time to eat while the other stands guard. Danger can come from every side, especially from hyenas and lions. Cheetahs are not strong enough to resist them, so if they approach, the cheetahs will have to give up the catch. These cheetahs have chosen the strategy of hunting as a pair to optimize their predatory strength and to improve their chances of actually consuming their catch. Another feline faced with the same problem might have a different strategy. Leopards too often have their prey stolen. Although they are great hunters and made of solid muscle, they give in to all large African carnivores, except for the cheetah. This one is taking refuge in a tree because he is literally besieged by a family of lions. The object of their interest is this new carcass. A victim that the leopard has dragged up into the tree, as he always does, to avoid its being stolen by others. Leopards, unlike cheetahs, store food and come back to the same meal several times, so they have to protect their larders. And from that standpoint, this tree is perfect. This is strategic behavior. It's not instinctive nor generalized. In countries where leopards are not threatened by other predators, they consume their prey on the ground and leave it there. Surprisingly, this leopard must be feeling harassed, although the lions cannot do anything to harm it at this height. It decides to take a chance and run away. Two young lions chase after it unenthusiastically, which shows that the family was really only interested in the new carcass. The savanna is full of thieves, or shall we say opportunists. Animals that for one reason or another do not hunt, or that wait until another animal has done it for them. Vultures share this speciality with hyenas. They usually compete for the same carcasses. These vultures are momentarily disconcerted because the hyena is not in its usual place. This time, it was the victim. A lion killed it during the night. The unusual situation doesn't upset the scavengers for long, except for the fact that the hyena's skin is particularly tough and their beaks are not strong enough to tear it. A stork in the area got something of a head start. It's already carrying off a few meters of intestine. Finally, the vultures found a way to get at it from the inside, a traditional solution, really. The dispute will have an unusual, unpredictable consequence. The stork gets pushed around and gets its feet caught up in the intestine. The hyena appears to be still intact, but in fact its entrails are almost entirely gone already. When the stork comes back, we can see that things have not improved much. The intestine is wrapped around its right foot now. The situation comes as something of a surprise. Both the stork's feet are free, and it doesn't really have any operational problems. But it's so upset by the incident that it seems to have forgotten how to fly. Minor daily problems can be important.
This lioness is only superficially injured, but she's tormented continually by flies. In fact, they've infected the wound and the infection is spreading. The lioness is sick and doesn't really have the strength to hunt. To eat, to survive, to put some weight back on and restore her health, she will have to change her strategy. She's lucky that her species is opportunistic. She has several possibilities. She can eat more carrion than usual. She can steal the prey of a cheetah that she manages to scare off. Or she can hunt small game that by and large she thinks isn't worth the effort. One thing is certain. For the moment she can't hope to hunt for gazelles. The ecological relationship between the lion and its prey is fascinating and complex. Both of them have evolved together for millions of years, but neither has ever got an upper hand. The prey have developed self-defense and avoidance strategies, while the predators have improved their strategies for attacking. These Thompson gazelles have gradually refined their knowledge of danger and defined the distances beyond which they're not concerned about a predator. This is a precise, stable distance that takes account of the time of day, the state of the terrain, and of course the type of predator they've detected. This safety distance is from 50 to 300 meters for a lion, but if a cheetah, their worst enemy, is in the area, it can be as much as 1,500 meters. Cheetahs nearly always choose an open plain as a hunting ground. In this landscape, they can put their speed to best use. Unlike other predators, they often look for food in the middle of the day. An exceptional strategy that seems deliberate, so that they are not confronted with active lions and hyenas. To find prey, the cheetah explores its territory slowly. It counts on its sense of smell, and particularly its exceptional eyesight. It must detect its prey from a distance and move up slowly. It moves in discreetly up to a distance of less than a hundred meters before it goes into the chase. For a cheetah hunting on its own, a herd of zebras mixed with news is not a reasonable objective unless it can detect the presence of a few young animals that it can try to isolate from the group. Good, strong young animals, because cheetahs, unlike other less demanding predators, never attack animals in poor condition. The cheetah misses its mark. It happens often. The pads of its feet are burning hot from the contact with the ground during the dash. The cheetah's hunting strategy corresponds to its morphology. Its long legs and thin body mean that it can run very fast, but only for a short distance. Less than 300 meters. After that, it's totally breathless. Its heart is pounding and it has to stop. It really has no alternative. It must get very close to its prey before launching the attack. At this point, the cheetah's temperature has risen significantly, and any potential prey has at least half an hour's respite. The cat must recover a normal biological condition before hunting again. Its two best arguments are its non-retractable claws that literally keep its feet riveted to the ground, and its powerful long legs that can push it to 110 kilometers an hour. Another try. Once again, the cheetah approaches carefully. When it makes the dash, it's aiming at a specific target, a young zebra alone with its mother. 
Its technique consists of scattering the animals in separate directions. But the mother's defensive strategy is just right. She runs a zigzag course that breaks the cat's path and saves her offspring. Gazelles escape less often. On the right terrain, with this kind of prey, the cheetah is remarkably effective. Every other time, it brings down its victim. This is a gourmet hunter. Essentially, it eats the victim's muscles and never the digestive tract. This cheetah has detected the presence of a lion on the other side of the river. Lions terrify cheetahs. Not just because they steal their prey, but because lions will kill cheetahs at every chance they get and really massacre the cheetahs' litters. The danger moves off but the cheetah still makes a futile attempt to hide its prey. A lioness weighs about 150 kilograms, measures a meter high at the withers and is nearly two meters long. You might think that a healthy lioness would be choosy and develop a strategy to choose her victims to suit her taste. The truth is quite different. She takes the easy way. This lioness has found an old carcass of a drowned buffalo. She is not fussy. She makes do with this rotten meat that has saved her any effort. Even so, her meal is a bit spoiled by the arrival of another lion. The lion's roar is its favorite means of communication. The roar can be modulated very precisely in both volume and tone. And here the message is intimidation. Opportunism is a common behavior in nature. There's nothing surprising about it in these marabou storks that act as real clean-up crews for the savannah and that are happy to have found fresh fish. Lions are not fussy. They will eat anything from mice to baby elephants, whatever may be at hand. In this case, it's a warthog one of their favorite victims. It's a modest prey, just a few kilograms. So when the whole family comes in to share it, they know that they will have to hunt again soon. This is a far cry from the five kilograms of meat they each need at this age. This lioness, who was not in on the hunt, is part of the family. She too would like to take advantage of the meal that the hunters have divvied up. She weaves from one to the other and would be content with any morsel the others might leave. Some have kept the largest portions, but they can't be counted on to share.
This lioness has been abandoned by her family and she can no longer depend on collective hunts. She will be systematically excluded when the prey is allocated. She'll have to hunt on her own and given her condition, she'll have to choose easy prey. Here is a prey that's perfect for a weak hunter. At birth, the new strategy is based on their speed of adaptation. The young change from the fetal condition to hard reality in the savannah in record time. It takes them six minutes, sometimes only three, to get up, stand on their feet and begin to suckle. At this age, this is a horrendous feat and the temptation to lie down on the grass is great. What this baby doesn't know is that life and death hang in the balance. The parents know that predators are waiting and they don't want to stay in one place. They need to keep moving to limit the risk of attack. They take the offspring that can go along with them. The little group moves off. The young animals are carefully flanked. This is something of a bluff because none of them could stand up to an attack, but it works. In any case, well enough to ensure survival of the species, even if it means heavy losses. All the predators have to do, even the weakest of them, is come and pick off the newborns that didn't want or were not able to follow. These piecemeal predators are only relatively successful. They have barely killed their modest prey when they may have to abandon it just as fast to another carnivore standing by that they know is stronger. When it comes to food, a healthy lion strategy depends to a large extent on the species of prey that are available. In areas where giraffes represent a substantial share of the large game, lions may well include them on their menu. Surprisingly enough, when a lion hunts a buffalo, a gazelle or a giraffe, it takes no account of the direction of the wind to approach more discreetly. This is a difficult hunt. The lion's only chance of success is to manage to isolate an individual. As long as the target group sticks together, their comparative strength is too much for a lion. If the giraffes stick together, and if, as we can see here, a large male covers their withdrawal, the lion will give up and decide to try for an easier prey. This herd of topis would do the trick, but they needn't worry. Hunting time is over. When the sun comes up, it inhibits the lion's predatory instinct. These lions must think that the effort is too much for them in the heat, and they seem to agree to a truce. A 
A lion spends about 20 hours a day resting or sleeping, so it seems logical not to choose the hottest hours of the day to be active. While the lions are sleeping, the herbivorous animals take advantage. At this time, they go by the cats without fear, and more importantly, they can devote their efforts to the problem of food. They're essentially safe from any risk of immediate attack. When the day begins to fade, the predators wake up. This leopard comes down from the tree where it was sleeping. The caracal lynx comes out of hiding. This small feline has characteristic hair patterns on the ears. It weighs about 15 kilograms and measures 80 centimeters at the withers. This is an African lynx, although genetically speaking, it's quite different from the European lynx. It's a solitary, very skittish animal that is hard to observe. When it begins to hunt at dusk, it hardly knows what will be on the menu. It eats small gazelles, hares, mongoose, reptiles, birds, whatever comes its way. For the lioness and her cubs, the day's schedule is always the same. It starts with games and cuddling before the group leaves to hunt. This lynx has caught a lovely goose. To catch birds, it uses the strength of its powerful hind legs to jump up to three meters high. The caracal lynx has no rivals for the vertical dimension, like the leopard when it comes to running. Both of them have to adopt a stalking strategy to approach discreetly. Their chance comes for only a few seconds at the right time of attack, and if they miss it, they must start all over again. This feline needs one kilogram of meat per day. It carefully removes the feathers before it eats the bird. When the female is ready to give birth, she takes all the feathers and the down to build a little nest in an abandoned lair.
When the sun sets, all the animals in the savanna get ready for darkness. For predators, this means that prey will be easier to catch. For the potential victim, the risks are greater. For the feline family, the difference between male and female is essentially a question of size. But with lions in particular, there's also this spectacular mane. This very clear sexual dimorphism has a direct effect on role sharing in the pride. The lioness hunts more often. The females are more effective because they are lighter and more flexible. On the other hand, they expect the males to defend them against other predators or undesirable fellow lions. And for that, the lion's morphology makes the difference. He has the mass and the mane. It acts like a shield in combat, like a dissuasive ornament. The lioness can count on the male's appearance, which is enough to ward off aggressors. But the lion's cumbersome mane gets in the way when it comes to hunting. It reduces his mobility and his discretion. Leopards only come out at night, no doubt to improve their chances of capturing prey. They are the least effective of all the big cats. They make a kill only one time out of ten. This one tried to defend its prey and had to leave it to the hyenas. It lost some skin in the process and is now carefully disinfecting the spot. Every animal has a chance to adopt a specific strategy at night to improve its protection. Baboons, that live mainly on the ground during the day, have all climbed a tree that serves as a dormitory until dawn. This male has monopolized the little antelope that a lioness in the pride killed early that morning. No one protested when he stole the prey. From a very early age, lions integrate this basic concept of their social life. Food is available according to rank. At dawn, a hyena has killed a young gnu, and two jackals are circling in the hope of stealing a piece. Jackals, small members of the canine family, work in teams of two. La stratégie des chacals qui travaillent en paire consiste à créer un dérangement permanent autour de la Their strategy consists of continually creating a disturbance around the hyena until at some point it's aggravated to the point that it leaves the prey to chase one of them off.
The hyena knows the game though and is very patient. The jackals do their best but they don't really succeed. It's really a question of which animal will tire first. The jackals are taking bigger and bigger risks. This time the ploy succeeded. One of the jackals has distracted the hyena enough for the other to steal a leg of the prey. This one hasn't eaten yet and now has to manage on its own. It takes a chance of getting fatally bitten but is clever enough to get away with it. Jackals are scavengers, but they're also very good hunters that attack snakes, birds, small warthogs. They can even bring down a gazelle if it's not too big. If it is too big, things can go wrong. When it comes to implementing a strategy, jackals are some of the most remarkable animals in the savannah, and they're surprisingly adaptable. By and large, they live in couples on a territory that's regularly marked off. This is one of the rare mammals that's faithful to its partner. These animals can set up a strategy that puts them on top in almost any situation. Their solution is always to seek complementarity in teamwork. This female jackal has killed a gazelle, but she's harassed by a horde of vultures trying to steal her meal and they seem sure to prevail through numbers. As long as the jackal is on her own, the situation is impossible. She never gets a chance to eat her prey. The arrival of her partner changes things. He takes off after the vultures and gives her a chance to eat. To make the most of the situation, she pulls the prey into a bush where the vultures won't try to get at it. Jackals are not only clever, they plan ahead. The male is burying the surplus food. He'll come back to this well-hidden larder when he feels the need. The hyena has eaten the whole new, except for the little piece that the jackals managed to steal. It has ingurgitated nearly 10 kilograms of meat and bone much more than the daily ration that's estimated at two or three kilos. This is why the mother ate so much so quickly. She cannot stay away too long from the community lair where her brood is waiting for her impatiently. They get together with biting and licking all signs of affection, identification and recognition.
This custom where each animal raises a leg to present the most vulnerable spot to the other is common in hyenas at all ages. It's their way of greeting each other. There are one or two young in a litter. After 16 weeks of gestation, they are born with their eyes open and with well-developed teeth. The mother takes care of her babies in a separate lair until they're about 10 days old. Then she brings them back to the community lair that they share with other youngsters, while the mothers take it in turns watching and feeding them. The young animals can eat meat already from two and a half to nine months, but in fact they get essentially all their nourishment from their mother's milk. For once in animal society, the sister counts for more than her brother. Hyenas live in a very structured society led by the females. In this society, the highest ranking male stands lower than the weakest female. In the first weeks of their lives, little hyenas, like all babies, spend a lot of time playing with their litter mates. But these games and simulated fights can go too far. When two females vie with each other like this, it's not unusual for one of the young to deliberately kill her sister. For lion cubs, complicity is part of the fun of being young. Together, they chew on their first bone as they enjoy the prey their mother has brought in. Sometimes they fight over a bone or a piece of skin, but it's all in fun. Lion cubs really enjoy being together. Their companionship will go well beyond their youth and will serve as a survival strategy later on. Just before they reach three years old, when the lions become young adults, they'll be driven out of the pride. Often litter mates will get together at that point to find their food and conquer their territory. They set up a kind of coalition that makes everything easier. The mothers are very fond of their cubs and watch over them for a long time. In the first few days of their lives, not only are they carefully tended, they are carefully hidden because they are very vulnerable. A hyena would happily make short work of them. This lioness has the impression that her hiding place has been discovered, so she's taking her baby to a safer place. A lioness has one to four cubs in a litter. They are born after 110 days of gestation. She looks worried, but then she knows how hard it will be to bring up this baby. A wild lion has a life expectancy of only about 12 years, but most cubs never reach adulthood. The strategy of adult males looking for females and a territory is one important reason for the high rate of cub mortality. To take possession of a pride, challengers will kill the cubs sired by other males. They eliminate potential competition and, more importantly, make the females available for mating.
The first moments of a cub's life are likely to be the best. They don't know what a hard life they have to look forward to. It won't be quite so hard for the females. They can stay in the pride their whole lives, surrounded by their mother, sisters, grandmother. Their lives will be spent tracking prey, mating and raising their young. Like their mother today, they will have the satisfaction of these discovery tours with their offspring. For the little males, things are different. Once they have been cast out of the pride, they will have to wander and fight a lot to take their turn at the head of a pride. At that point they will be six or seven, and they will reign over the harem for only a year or two. Then they will be driven out again to live a difficult, solitary life. This lion cub has been abandoned by its mother, which happens sometimes when the lioness prefers a stronger or more resourceful cub. For a while it follows a lioness who has two very young cubs. The strategy is a simple one, trying to be adopted. The lost cub is keeping his distance. He knows that moving in is a touchy thing and that he'll have to work his way in gradually, hoping that at some point he can join the others and take part in their games. The abandoned cub won't find a soft spot with this mother. She has detected his presence and doesn't seem to like the way he is pushing. Instinctively, this little lion, whose fur is still spotted like a baby, feels that it must find a new family at all costs. He must be accepted by an adult lioness or his future will be short-lived. The lioness is becoming increasingly wary as the cub approaches. Her babies are playing, not caring about the perspective of having a new companion. The lioness has made up her mind. She brutally refuses to have anything to do with this intruder and won't have him in the vicinity. Once she is sure that she's driven off the unwanted cub, the lioness goes back a bit selfishly to enjoy the intimacy of her family that her cubs are so happy to share. The orphan cub strategy wasn't the right one, at least with this relatively close-knit family. His hope of survival now depends on hunting easy prey, attacking small mammals, birds, reptiles, anything weak. He has to survive on his own, 
until he gets a new chance that will have to come very soon. Or maybe his mother will be in the area and will accept him.